Fuji Sports. Listen, they've been working with us for a while now. Um, particularly, they've been supporting and sponsoring this show for over a year. And uh, they have some cool stuff going on, on their website, don't they? They always have cool stuff. Uh, amazing gear. Anything you would need for your jiu-jitsu journey, you can find at fujisports.com. But just scrolling through right now, uh, apparel, obviously, geese, bags, anything you could possibly ask for, you can find at fujisports.com. Hey, it's been a while since we started Roll TV Project. Uh, it's been a while since you started it. I did come in later, and um, I can't say enough about it, especially the new platform. It's really amazing, fully customizable, uh, and you know a little bit more about the structure. Well, so two things you need to know. One is the subscription service, which is 9 bucks a month. Um, you can get access to hundreds of videos, hundreds of drills, techniques, and so on, in a very nice labor, library categorized as you need them. But two different lessons. Um, you can actually purchase those individually, and you own them, so the subscription is not tied to it at all. You can look at things like spider guard, half guard sweeps, half guard chokes, um, uh, folding pass, and so on. There are so many of them out there. So take a look um, and see where you need help with the videos, right? 30%. If you type in Roll Radio as a code, who doesn't like saving money, go to RollAcademy.tv. What's up, everyone, and welcome back. If you haven't already, please remember to hit the share, like, subscribe, download, listen, and whatever other button there is, and leave us a review wherever you do listen. That ensures that we can continue bringing you the great guests and amazing content that you have come to expect. On this episode, Mateus Lutes joins us to discuss his road as one of the Jiu-Jitsu World's top competitors to a new academy owner. Mateus knew from the time he was a purple belt that he would be an academy owner, and he never had a plan B. Today, he describes how everything he did while training and competing was to help him achieve his goals of owning a world-class gym and how he made his vision for his family's future into a reality. He also describes how he dealt with the pressures he put upon himself to achieve his goals on and off the mats and how the setbacks he faced made him into the successful person he is today. Here's the role radio with five-time world champion, seven-time Pan American champion, Marcelo Garcia Black Belt, and co-owner and head instructor at Royal Jiu-Jitsu, Mateus Lutes. Welcome to Raw Radio. Yes, sir. We are live. Here we are again. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I just got back from the doctor. So I'll know more in a couple of days. But uh, <laughs> are, you, are you expiring? Right no. Well, aren't we all? <laughs> uh, I, no, I am. Uh, I just went for a, a physical. I didn't get one last year, uh, COVID and, and all that nonsense. Um, so I went uh, I went today and we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> we'll see how much you're falling apart. <laughs> well, I know how much. I don't need a doctor for that. Uh, I, I know. I was that. told you need to stop snacking. Uh, I heard that you were told. Well, we did discuss this a little bit. Yes, uh, not stop snacking. Stop, stop snacking late at night. Oh, and it's that it's that nine ten o'clock urge mm. where I know there's a for a beer for a beer. Or there's cookies or something <laughs> like that, and I got to stay away from that <laughs> stuff. I when I stepped on the scale there. Uh, which reminds me, our scale here is a little off. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's not going to be, after seeing those numbers, it's not going to be hard to not snack tonight when I get home. So. <laughs> Just tonight. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what the blood work says. <laughs> well, I hope things work out for you. I'm, I'll be fine either way. Yeah, right? Don't, don't, don't expire yet because... We need you here. You'll uh, get another co-host. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Let's, is that what let's, it is? Yes, let's get to this. Let's thing. get to the conversation. Um, professor, thank you for, for joining us. How are you today? I'm fantastic, guys. Thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate the invitation. I'm I, very happy to be here. I see you're at the Academy. Um, and yes, if, we are. Yeah, and if you've never seen Royal Jiu-Jitsu, you should check out their social media. And, and, and what a beautiful, beautiful Academy. And right off the bat, I got to ask you, what made you create such a clean-looking facility and such a professional, at least from the outside as we're looking in, such a clean and professional-looking facility um, you know, at your academy? What was the thought behind that? 
it's it's like years of thinking and absorbing observing and uh, and having information storage but the most important is when i'm driving my way home i pass through this apple store every day and you, when you look at inside it gives you this like second of peace like you're driving you see dark buildings at night like everything is dark and gray and when you see that wall white, that's beautiful, that's peaceful, that brings your attention. That is one of the reasons that I got the Academy to be with this looking. And also, you need, like, the Academy is where you're going to spend most of your time. So you need a place that will enjoy to be there that is going to give you good energy and has to be clean. I hate when my house is dirty, and I will hate when my Academy is dirty. So that's the reason <laughs> that I make sure that the place Got to have a good looking, got to be clean and very welcome. Is it a nightmare to clean? We have a good season. Let's put it like that. <laughs> Listen, in the cleaning. I, I'm making jokes and all this because your academy looks very much so like mine. Or I should say mine looks very much so like yours. Uh, you got gray mats, white walls. You know, it, it, it's very, very similar from the appearance perspective. And, and I know there are challenges behind keeping it clean <laughs> or clean looking, right? It's um, a yes. very, very white look um creates its own its own dynamics do you think that clean looking academy is important for the students it's for people who never train jiu-jitsu definitely is because think about it martial arts was always very intimidating in america since they started the early movies with a lot of karate kung fu or the martial arts is very intimidating and every academy every martial arts that it that that it is is very dark very like closed environment, always in a very sketchy place. So that creates the, the stigma that people feel intimidated to walk into an academy. When you have a clean place that it has a beautiful look, that is welcoming to parents, to kids, to people who never trained with you, to special people do who is being out of shape or people who never did any much sports before, you have to break the, the stigma, you have to break this first barrier between you and the new student. So I feel the look of the academy is very important by the way you approach your new clients. But some might say, let, let, let me challenge you here a little bit so just to have a conversation. But some might say, who cares about the look? You know, we train hard. We have the best, best competitors, best instructors. Who cares about what it looks like? You know, it's clean. Nothing is going to happen here. What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, you have two different, but you talk about two different academies and two different goals over here. That's it. You have the academy that has a goal to create like only athletes that is not academy that the main goal is to get more and more students into jiu-jitsu or you have the academy that the main goal is to have more and more students to bring more and more people into the jiu-jitsu world that's my goal when you have a place that only cares about building competitors you don't have enough time to think about the aesthetics of the place or how the place looks and stuff like that and in my opinion you should because in the end of the day that's your brand. That's who you are. Everybody should be very careful and, and how to, to uh, what I can say, to present their own place because videos and pictures, that's what people are going to think about your gym. That's the interesting part, isn't it? Today, when we pick up our phones, that's the first thing that we do. We Google things, whether it's a restaurant or a jiu-jitsu place, and whatever we see on those first few photos that's what we start thinking about that place. It's like the perception 100%. that's being created. And is it, that, and a and moment ago, you talked about that stigma of, of martial arts and of fighting in general, especially jiu-jitsu, right? Present in mixed martial arts and MMA, UFC, and so on. A lot of students out there are concerned about getting hurt, um, um, perhaps getting um, injured, and then obviously, you know, is this place safe, quote unquote, right? And so creating this positive image around it, it appears to be very, very important. Why do you it think? It is. Go ahead. I, I, it's, you describe everything the right way because today, guys, the, the sport is growing so fast and things are going in a very positive way for jiu-jitsu. You cannot stick to this old idea that we only need to create the toughest guys on earth and we have to be in this little dungeon to make that. No, you can have a very nice place with good looking and you still can train hard because in the end of the day, it's all about the mat space. It's not about like 
you, you're going to train hard in a beautiful gym and in a dungeon the same way. So why not go for the beautiful place, right? Why do you think so many don't do that? In my opinion, most of it is vision. A lot of people has a moment vision. They have only, I want to think all about the present. I don't want to think about the future. And that may be one of the main reasons. Also can go financially because as you say, you own your own place. You know, it costs more to clean. And it's not only products to clean. Labor costs more to clean. You, it costs more to build. And people always trying to shrink their costs and, and the maintenance to, to have higher profit. Maybe that's one of the reasons as well. But that can all add up and create a problem. But don't you think if you create a good academy, a nice looking academy, more people will come and that co those costs kind of offsets that because you start making more money. Oh, 100%. Right? But that's what I was saying. We're thinking about the future. We think yeah. about the, the further student. We invest in the place to have more students. A lot of people don't like to do that. They think only about the moment. It's about I set up the gym and that's it. I put $10 on this gym. I'm not putting any more money. I want to want money back. So if you keep putting money in the gym, it's like it's taken out of your moment profit. And But in the end of the day, in the long run, you're going to be getting more and more students. And that's why you say how many academies you open here and there, and they're not as successful as different academies. If something is, is wrong. Maybe you don't have enough classes. Maybe your gym is not clean enough. You understand? Maybe they... The, the facility is not in a good location, have a good clean or a good looking look, uh, location. You understand? All these things yeah. adds up in bringing the students in the long run. What I think was really important, what you are talking about is running business. We are, it, it, everything you described is to set that business for success. And so it happens, it's just Jiu Jitsu Academy. We sell a service of Jiu Jitsu. Right, but it's it, it it's almost similar to going to the restaurant to a dirty restaurant. We would yeah. never come back to it. I mean, it it it. A hundred percent. Yep, that's one of the first. Whenever I walk into a restaurant, one of the first things I do is I look at the floor, and if the floor is dirty, mm -hmm. you know, it's like uh, I I just I know that that's going to set the tone for everything else. And I think when I walk into a gym, it's the same way. It's like if the if the mats and and we're not only talking about like cleanliness, we're talking about the clean look, mm -hmm. the sharpness of it, and everything. And I think when I walk into a gym, it's the same way. Where if it's like, you know, if it you get hit with a smell, right, which <laughs> often happens, you don't want that. Well, that's a big part um, of it too. It right? is, it is. Uh, and then I think that sets the tone. I know what kind of academy it is just by those factors. Yeah, you know? yeah. The, when did when does this vision of yours started? We, we see results of it right now. But when, 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 did, when did the little things start going in your mind, this is what you want? I know exactly what happened. I was a purple belt. I just got, got married and I have my first child. And I realized that I want to live out of Jiu Jitsu. And the way, that you, the way I would be able to provide a future, consistent future for my family is if I own my own academy and run the way that you guys are describing, perfectly aligned, clean, well, successful gym that you, I have a, a long term facility that is going to be able to build a consistent future for me and for my family was October 2018. That's when I really came back, come back to training as a proper belt. And I had to go that I'm going to do the best I can in the few years that I have in the lower belts. I'm going to achieve my black belt and open my own academy in Long Island. That's where I leave Long Island, New York. And it's, what did it take to achieve oh, this? A lot of dedication. Oh, I can only imagine. I, I mean, I, I, I've experienced similar things as you have. And, and, and you, you know, what, what did it take? So you have this idea. There's this vision, right? What's the first step for you to get closer to that goal that, that you described? The first point that I know that I have to do is absorb information. I have to learn everything that I can about Jiu-Jitsu and Jiu-Jitsu Academy business. What I mean that you have to be a good teacher, so you got to learn a lot of Jiu-Jitsu movements and techniques. But in the end of the day, you got to learn about gyms. Like you got to, com I compete a lot, so I go to places, I meet people, I ask questions that usually a competitor wouldn't ask. And you you data all the info if it's in paper, if it's in a computer, if it's in your mind. You got to keep all of that things that you like and things that you don't. And the most important, that is anybody can do that. You don't have to be a world champion. You don't have to be uh, training the best academy in the world. Anybody can do that. Anybody can ask questions to 
Can I ask you a question and ask this? Oh, people are actually you're going to be surprised. People are very happy to answer. Mm -hmm. You visit a different academies. Just take a note. Write down what I like it and what I don't like about this place. And just like that, if you visit 20 gyms, you have 20 things that you like it. And you can formulate your own academy. And that's one of those. Is the first step to build the academy is getting as much as information I could. But what it really takes was a lot of dedication in the competitor competitor side because I had a goal to do everything I can and achieve a lot of things uh, in the period of three years. So I have my black belt from Marcelo and I achieve a, a black belt coming from Marcelo. And everybody like kind of recognized me in the jiu-jitsu world. So when I opened my academy, I wouldn't start for nothing. I'll have something that will be my foundation, something that I'll rely on it to, to promote the academy. You understand? Yeah. And that was the hardest part. And the most important is every day when I didn't want to do it anymore, I didn't talk about going and winning a tournament. I was always thinking about the main goal that was only my own academy. And my close friends know that since I was a purple belt, I always wanted to have my own place. Do you think that you have reached your goal or there are still things ahead of you? A hundred percent. The first goal is already achieved and I already achieved the second goal. I'm setting more and more goals and I, I'm willing to achieve all of them. It, it appears to me, um, Gary, what do you think? But it appears to me like you are extremely goal oriented. It appears to me that there, there is a mission in front of you and, and, you always try to figure out how to get to that goal, how to achieve that goal. Is that, am I on the right track? Yes, of course, because I don't have a background plan. I don't have a second chance. I need to set a goal and reach that goal. It's no second option for me. So when I had a goal, I'd say I have to do everything that I can to achieve that. It's very important for me to get into that point. So I tried everything I could. I, I dedicated every single second of my life into that goal. And, and I reached that. And I, I'm pretty sure a lot of people read this book that is from, uh, you uh, can't hurt me from David Goggins. Oh, yeah. I don't know how to pronounce his name. And he's like, what he says there in the book, he says brilliant things in the book. But one thing that he said that kept, caught me is you set small goals to achieve a big goal. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing that like, for a long time in my life, even before I read the book. So when I read that, it just reinforced that I have somebody who is very successful and is been doing this for long that I am and it worked for him. So I kept that with me that I set the small goals. I achieved that goal. I set another small goal and then realize you're closer to a biggest goal. You're closer to the point that you want it to be. But, and then you set another bigger goal and by small steps, you achieve that. But it's so hard to do that. Like it, so many people out there, they want to change the world. They want to be a world champion. They want to have the academy. They want to have a new house. They want to have a new career. They, they want to have these big things. And they don't see all the work that it takes to achieve that, to get there. Um, why, why do you think it's so difficult to make these little changes versus these big ones? It takes, um, in my case, I, is, I, is only one answer. I had a daughter, I have a family, and I had to take care of them. And I'm very responsible over that because of the way that I was raised from. My mother did everything that she could for me and my siblings. And I had this will inside of me that I will provide for my family no matter what. And that was the goal that really drove me. That was the motive that really drove me to achieve my goals. A lot of times I, I told him giving up. Everybody has those thoughts. Everybody wake up in the morning. I don't want to do this. It's too much work. It's so far away. And I just had to keep going because I wasn't fighting just for me. You understand? I was fighting for somebody else. And I don't know if you guys have kids, but when you have a kid, you realize how you would do everything and more in your hands to to make their lives better and that's how i live my life that's one of the reasons that i opened my gym and i fought different tournaments i went through a lot of stuff because of them because of my family did you feel you had extra pressure leading up to major competitions 1000 percent, 1000 percent. not like it's i took so many fights that i wasn't supposed to take just because i need to get paid i went to so many tournaments and in my head i couldn't lose 
because that will hurt will hurt me, my goals, my family was a lot of pressure on me. I wasn't I wasn't like a regular 23, 24 years old guy has nothing to do. I was like a 23, 24 years old guy who's married, have a family and had a lot of bills to pay and like have to just keep going and keep working and keep fighting. How do you how do you manage that pressure? How do you manage that anxiety of I don't have a choice to lose. There's no option. There's, there's only one path and that's go forward. I don't I, I can't say that I overcome them. I don't think I manage them like completely manage completely like took them away because I think that is impossible. They will always hunt me. I just make peace with it. is like this is what I'm gonna live my life with and I'm gonna have to just accept the situation and 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 do things that that, that I can do. I cannot control the situation, I want to control. So in competition wise ways like I cannot control what the other person is going to do to me. I, mm-hmm. The only thing I can control is I can train as much as I can and, and be the most prepared I can, you understand? And that's the best you can do. People think that competing, you can control everything that's going to happen there. So you can't. Sometimes people come to me, oh, I did this and I did that and I messed up here. And I think, yes, you, you could have done better, but also have to give marriage to the other person because that person did that to you. You understand? Yeah. That's what really happened. And that's a reality that people don't really uh, put in perspective. You cannot control the other person's movement. You got to control yourself. And that's, the, and, that's kind of, and, and, and that's kind of the beauty of jiu-jitsu, right? I mean, we can only do what we can do, but we can't control the other. We can't control our partner. We can't control our opponent in, in the sense of they have their own brain. They have their own ideas, their own objectives. Very similar to our lives, wouldn't you agree, Gary? Yeah, and I, so how do you how did you deal with any of the the setbacks that came along with all that added pressure? Man, like it's a lot of setbacks. But one thing that I always did is the next morning you always gotta wake up and go to work. You just gotta keep grinding. You will have setbacks, and the setbacks is what built you in who you are. In a way that if everything went perfect for me, I wouldn't be able to wake up today five in the morning to go teach a class four days a week. If I didn't have to wake up five in the morning, to go teach somewhere else. You understand? Yeah. Like, Literally. and like I have to wake up in the morning and go teach this private class. Otherwise I'm not going to be able to pay the car insurance. Yeah. Like okay. these things drive and, and build and create who you are. And those very important when you lost a fight and, and you stay six months without nobody inviting you to a tournament. And when you had a chance again, that setback just create this thing on you that you cannot lose. You got to go with everything you have and, and just build you into like a better version of yourself. And every time winning or losing, you just keep creating a better version of yourself. Wouldn't you agree that setbacks, obstacles, and even failures are critical to who we become in the future? Meaning... Without them, we wouldn't be able to learn new things. Um, we wouldn't be able, even though it sucks to fail, um, but they allow us to get better. 100%. Guys, I'm sorry. I'm just going to have to move this a little bit. My Wi-Fi was cutting off. I'm getting closer to oh, the you're Wi-Fi. Fine. You're fine. You're fine. Now we get to see oh, different angles. Yeah, now we get a different shot of the gym. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like was bothering me because you guys are freezing a little bit. He is very close to the mode, and so he's going to be easier. Let me just make sure guys going to be able to see me. That's it. You're good. We good? Oh, yeah. For phenomenal. Sure. Phenomenal. All right. Great. Yeah, but like once again, they all... failures, as you mentioned, it sucks, man. Every time you fail into something, if it's business, into a relationship, or into a competition, it it doesn't feel good. But that. That is what is say. How are you going to overcome? How are you going to manage this pressure, this failure? If you're able to channel that into a very good way that is going to give you more fuel, it is perfect. Yeah. Well, that's the only like, thing you can control, right? Is how you react to it. Not everything else. It's already, it's over. It's in the past, right? So it's only again, what you can do. Once again, you mentioned right there, you can, you can only control certain, uh, certain things then. You cannot control the results of a fight. You can control how much you train or how you react after that. 
but you cannot control the fight. You cannot control if you're going to fail or succeed. You can just prepare yourself the most you can. Or after that, you can only control the, like how the energy after the fight, how it's going to build you. I remember when I won a very big tournament and right after that, I was so scared to compete because I would lose my momentum. Like, oh man, now if I lose, everybody's is going to expect me to win and like what I'm going to do about this. And that was like eating me alive. And when I lost the tournament and I felt like, like the end of the world and I was training with so much, uh, not anger, with so much sadness on me. Like I wanted to go back. That's not what I am about. And it was one of the best, my best performance I had right after that. So it is a is it's two different like the 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 setback actually gave me more leverage than the win, but I actually in another moment of it when I won a tournament I built so much confidence that I have a very good streak win right after that I went to to the next tournament feeling indestructible because I just had won a big one. It's it's different. It's different setup. It's different tournament. It's different feelings. Is is different ways to manage that. Do you recall your biggest setback? Do you remember your biggest failure? Something that is embedded, it was so strong for you? When I lost in... The, the saddest one, the one that really, like, broke me down, that made me, like, rethink everything and even stop training after that for six months, was when I lost in 2017. I lost words in gear purple belt because I had won words the year before our purple belt. I had, I, I was held back with my belt. My wife was pregnant. I was just changing academies and I lost and I was confused. Let's put it like that. At that moment, I was very confused. That was the one that really like made me really think about jujitsu and if I really want to do it or like, what is, what is, what is this? What is my goals? What I wanted to do with this. But the one that was the biggest loss was when I lost, um, was the biggest prize money when I lost in Korea. That was because that was a lot of money. It was two months before I opened the gym. So I lost $100,000 in Korea. And I was expecting to make that money to invest at the academy. In the end of the day, everything worked out. But that was like, what I'm going to do now? I will never be able to make this amount of money in one single tournament in Jiu-Jitsu. And I don't even recall any time that was this amount of this, such a big prize for tournament in history of jiu-jitsu. And I lost that. I had a chance to win and I lost. That was also really bad. But the 2017 Purple Bell Awards was really bad. Really bad. What was your mindset going in? Did you feel like you were fully prepared? You were ready for it? No. No, I was just confused. I had just changed academies. I had. I was in training full time. I was working already, and but I was still feeling that I was going to win. And when I lost, I thought I lost my time. Like I let the train pass. I was in the front of the train. Now I'm off of it. Everything is gone. I'm never gonna have another chance to be a champion. I'm never gonna. I'm never gonna make again. I, like I should just stop training jujitsu now and let it go. And I was already thinking uh, that I was like it's over. I'll never be like in the top of the line again. And a lot of people would quit. A lot of people. Oh, would, that's would. one of those. That's one of those times that you say that a lot of people are not able to, uh, to see the goals and follow the goals. And like, what? Wow, like it's so hard to keep achieving them. And it came to my mind many times. Everybody, like any champion has like, has, any successful person, let's put it like that, has a lot of moments that think about quitting. Because it's not a, it's not a, it's not easy path. It's very hard, and it's very lonely too. Because even if you have somebody with you side by side, those thoughts are still inside of your head, and it's still eating you every single second of your life. And you have to fight them, and it's really hard. It's in any field. I, I, I share a lot of experience with a lot of my friends and students now. In any different fields, in any different careers, they have very tough times. That everybody think about quitting. And the ones that I talk, and they're very successful in what they do, they always mention to me that not quitting is what makes them who they are. Like at that moment, everybody knows that a specific point mm -hmm. that they would break or make them. And was that the moment for you? 
that 2017? No, the, the, the moment that break me was that. And the moment that make me rise was in the same year when I came back to train. That I say, that's it. Because I look around, I was in a construction site. I was doing construction at the time. And I was tired. Was, I look at some guys that they've been doing that for their whole life. But they are happy because that's what they have. You understand? They like they they just that's who they are already. And I look around. I say, this is not me. I, I have a love for something. I have a passion, and it's something that I do good. This is not what I want for myself. And I was driving back to work, and I say, call my wife and say, listen, I'm going back to train. You're going to struggle for a long time, but I will make it. And that was a point that I say, I won't stop until I make it. And that was like the end of the year. It was a purple belt. I did a couple more fights. I fought an American no gi in, in New York. Like two months after that, I won weight in open class. I got promoted brown belt and I just kept going. And I know that the goal was achieved. I remember I was like, every man, I was sitting in this construction site and looking around and like, this is not what I want for my life. I wanted to, to have jiu-jitsu. This is what I came to America for. This is why I left everything in Brazil to, to move to America, to live from jiu-jitsu. And I want to live from it. And that moment made me. Good for you. Hey, listen, I want, I want to know what your wife said that day. You, you give her a call and say, listen, this is going to be rough. This is going to be rough for a while. But I can't do this. I have to do what I love. What is her answer? She was always with me. Still today, she always says, whatever, whatever you think, whatever you say, I support you and I'm with you because she saw in me that if I want to, she knows me better than anybody else. She, I spend time with her like more than I spend time with no with any friends, any family member. So she knows me very well. And she knows that I'm very stubborn when I want something, I will get it and I will do it. Like everything in my hands to make it. She, she, she talked to me and she said, listen, I will support you, whatever you decide. Let's go. Let's make it happen. She, we had like some like financials and choice to make it. She support me on every single one of them. Even if they sound crazy, she, she set, set up with me. She did everything. She came through all the way and we, we, we're in a good position now. She's my partner in the gym and we're very happy with the situation that I have set up here now. Regrets? Any regrets? Some, some regrets. Was it hard? The regret that I had. No, the regret that I have is that I didn't start early. Oh, well, there you go. I didn't see that answer common. Do you, no, th yeah. do you think there... you could have started earlier? Yes, I should have started earlier. How early? I should do you never have stopped. Yeah, you should stop. See, and th this is the interesting, sorry, Gary, this, this is the interesting part that at the time we feel that we need to quit. There is no future ahead. Like we, we feel this is it. I'm going to hang that belt. I'm going to, I'm done with this. I don't want to do this anymore. And then years later, we have that regret. Um, and even now you mentioned this, if I never stop, situation would be completely different. Um, I tell my students all the time, be, before you quit anything, anything, just really think a lot about this because that could be a point of regret five years, 10 years from now, um, that's a big decision to stop doing something that you love. Um, yeah, that's a hard well, one. Well, I forget who we were talking to, but they said, um, if you're thinking about quitting, just imagine yourself five years from now without jujitsu in your life. Are you going to be better off? You know, you might financially with work or whatever, that career might be better off and stuff. But if you keep doing jujitsu, there's going to be no... Um, it's not going to, nothing's going to get worse mm -hmm. if you keep going. Right. Yeah. So don't quit because you will look back and you will regret it. Yeah. Um, you, you, I mean, you mentioned, you know, um, black belt from, from Marcelo, you, you, that's a big point in your career, in your life, point of recognition and point of, um, a highlight to what you've done and where you are going. But I'm actually curious more about the beginning. Do you remember your very first day on the mat? Yes, I, I started doing judo. So I was like, in Brazil, you have this social project. It's called uh, Criança Esperança. It's like hope for kids. And I remember that I was so excited. I was like 12, 13 years old. 
and they just opened a space for judos. And my mom signed me up and I was so excited. I, I just love it so much fighting. And, and when I went, it was like, I'm not in square footage. It's harder to convert, but I'm not lying. It was like 200 square foot. It was like a room. It was like an office mm -hmm. that we had the, the mats on it. And you have like 20, 30 kids in that space. What? And there's no, <laughs> no gi. What? Are you guys no were sitting gi. on top no of each gi? other? No gi judo? Oh, my God. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's like the old judo mats everywhere. And the kids, like, it was insane. It was awesome. And there's no geese. Everybody trains with the my my professor had a like the extra gi tops. So what happened is he lives in the center. So like now you two go and we put the geese on and we fight out and take it off and the next kids use the same <laughs> gi tops. It was amazing. It was awesome. And that was awesome. I did judo for one year and a half, almost two years. And then at the church that I went to, this guy was a purple belt, brown belt in jiu-jitsu. Jiu and he started teaching jiu-jitsu in the basement. So I started training jiu-jitsu with him. And it was like, I instantly fell in love. Instantly fell in love with jiu-jitsu. Because my judo coach, he couldn't take all those kids into tournament and competition. So I felt that he was always holding us back because he couldn't do more. That's all they offer him understand mm -hmm. in brazil they all the resource always go to soccer or volleyball for the girls or basketball sometimes so they have in this whole place like all the the, the sports happening it was only a corner for 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 jiu-jitsu for judo in the case it was not because judo requires uniform requires belt and soccer no you just have a ball and just like that you have a court you have a ball and you have 50 kids in the program. In, in, in judo, no, we had all these like uniforms and it costs more and they couldn't provide for the kids. So I was always felt there was a setback. So then we went to, uh, I started training jiu-jitsu with this guy in the basement. It was like four, 15, 14. And it was awesome. It was very good. Like he hooked me up with a uniform right away. So it was my uniform. I just love it. And I, I started like, training like every day they had a class i go up first because it's the puzzle mats so we have to put them together we train and then we take them apart because after we start like the the meetings for the church and stuff like that but it was pretty cool do you remember the first throw that you learned in judo yes everybody remembers the first throw in judo <laughs> <Osoto> <laughs> Gary, yep <laughs> everybody learned the soto gari the first throw yep. oh, soto gari, on, that's an old good one yep. I, and I teach my white belts in, in the fundamentals program. The Soto Gari is a first throw. It's the most safe and simple throw you can teach somebody. Yeah. What's your okay. favorite throw? Uh, I always like the Ogoshi, the one that you grab the belt by underneath. It's, it's like a hip throw. Yeah. It's called the Ogoshi, the yeah. one that you grab by the belt. Yeah. It's, it's always my favorite throw. Yeah. You're talking to two judo guys here. So <laughs> we, we love, oh, the, we lo know. we love throwing oh people. Yeah. We love throwing yeah. people. It's fun. It's fun. You know what I love about, uh, so we were teaching throws in the kids class the other day. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a grip defense where you take the person down, but the footwork is very much like Osoto Gary. And it was so much fun to to see the kids go, oh, this is just like Osoto Gary. It's, so, it's just like Osoto Gary. And they were so excited that, yeah. that that throw does. It just lights people up. I don't know why, but that one, it really does. It gets people so excited. It's, it's the, the footwork of Osoto Gary in the fundamentals class, it takes like, I can divide the Osoto Gary class in three because you have the first one learning how to fall. Everybody, let's learn how to mm -hmm. fall. And then you have the entry, and I like to teach the entry that you lift, lift up, the yeah. jacket, and they sleeve so they get lights on their toes. Yeah. Because when you teach them only by the, the footwork, they really don't get it much. But when you teach them lifting, yeah. that the other person is leaning, uh, is like lifting all the weight on their toes, and you hit the person with the throw after, you go, oh my God, it really works. <laughs> I, really hit the, I really hit the takedown. Nobody believes judo until they go airborne. It's good stuff. <laughs> So listen, I, it, it 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 appears to me as the life um life of jujitsu. It, it's been very very rewarding for you. Um, a hundred. I, I, everything I have today. I met my wife through jujitsu. I had a business through jujitsu. My best friends are from jujitsu. I you, spend most of my time here. If you if you don't mind me asking, how did you meet your wife through jujitsu? Did so she train too? I was. Or? 
she does. She she's a purple belt now. But I met her. She was I was training at Unity Jiu Jitsu, and she came visit it like once a week. And then we start talking after that, like, oh yeah, nice. And we always start talking, but only saw her once a week. And I went to travel to compete. And when I come back, somebody say, oh, this person was there here, and, and she asked about you. I was like, oh, here we go. I know that's the one. Now. <laughs> and then after that, it's just a story. <laughs> well, good for you. Good for you. Well, my, see, my wife thinks I'm crazy doing jujitsu and owning a business academy, but <laughs> but yeah, this, it's important to have that support from family, from friends' perspective because one doing jujitsu is hard, but running jujitsu academy is even harder, right? Especially if it's your if it's your livelihood. Like this is how you feed your kids. This is how this is how you pay your mortgage. This is how you you live. Um, it's hard, isn't it? It just touched one of the most important points of why a lot of jiu-jitsu academies are not successful. Because people are still thinking they are just a competitor. They only have to show up and train and doesn't have much responsibilities. For me, you know, only in the academy, the easiest part is to teach the class. Yeah, I agree 100%. It's the easiest part. Like... You have to make sure that you study your academy. You have to make sure that you have feedback from your students. You have to make sure that you have a lot of classes on the schedule that fits everybody. You understand? Mm -hmm. You have to get a clean facility, as we spoke about. You need to have a very reliable uh, staff. You understand? You cannot just show up one day mm -hmm. and it's 6 in the morning and nobody's here with the doors open to teach the 6 in the morning class. Mm -hmm. It's you need to treat as a full business. Is no oh, it's your shih tzu. It's 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 okay. Everybody understand. People don't understand. People paying for that. They wanted the service, and you have to treat it as as a as a business and often in the best service you can. And that's what is going to determine if you're going to have a successful gym or not. Yeah, a lot of people think that jujitsu instructors they they show up for an hour, teach one class, they go home, they go surfing sometimes, right? And we, we just sit on the beach, do nothing else. No, oh my God. I have so many <laughs> uh, chores I have to do every day. It's always something. So busy all the time. How much do you think, if you had to break it down, I'm curious now, if you had to break it down, teaching versus everything else, like the operational business things, what is your, what is it, what is your breakdown? You can put like 60, 40. 60 of 60 what? Operational 40 teaching yeah, because good. I teach a lot of classes. <laughs> what happened is I'm, I'm in charge to do all the, the uh, payment processing for the academy. I review everybody's memberships and stuff like that. I have, I mean, I'm responsible to do all the purchase for the gym, going to the stores, buy cleaning supplies, water, whatever it takes. I'm also responsible to make all the payments and calculate the hours of the staff. All right. And I'm responsible for all the other stuff, like all the little runs I have to do, all the little fixing that you have to do. I'm responsible for that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that takes time and takes a lot of time. Yeah. And we're not even talking about improving on new things or, or things that you want to introduce. We're not even touching. This is always, just always, always. Yep. I, I, I spend hours like just sitting down and, and creating the schedule, the grade of the classes for the next week. And like preparing all the classes and, and, and see like what I taught three weeks ago is going to be connected with what I'm teaching today. If we follow in the program and um, it's, it takes time. It takes hours to prepare that. It takes hours to, to like access content and look at videos and, and understanding what you want to teach, what is going to be the, uh, the movements, picking up parts of the position that you wanted to put into your class. Yeah, I wish more people took the same approach. It is. Uh, why are you laughing, Gary? Because uh, uh, we talk about this stuff a lot <laughs> when uh, when uh, you know, when we're not on the podcast. Yeah. Um, how hard was it for you? I mean, you always had this goal of of being an instructor and an owner, but we often talk about um, that maybe high level competitors don't make the best instructors. Mm -hmm. And how was it for you to to make that transition, or was it something that you've you've always done were you teaching as, as a purple belt and, and picking that up back then so one thing that was very easy for me that i i had spent 2018 and 19 at marcelo uh, marcelo garcia academy 
and they have a very good culture over private classes. So I was very busy teaching private classes at Marcelo. And when you have a private in, in the city is a little different because maybe a private class in, in a different state or a different place that is a person trains at the academy and then do a private once a week, maybe once every 15 days with one of the instructors. Marcelo had people who only train with you because you're the only one who feed the work schedule. It's crazy work schedule in the city. So you become the main instructor for that person. So you have to prepare what you're going to show to them. And if you want a long-time customer, you cannot just be showing, ah, I'm going to show you this and that's it. No, you really have to create a special curriculum for that person with their body type, their age group, or even their belt level. So when you start preparing yourself with that, you start creating this, this ability to, to build a curriculum or build a classes connections for students. And I have like 10 of those students. So you, you start like understanding a little more over how to prepare classes. And also I was very close in contact with the person who is responsible for the, to running the academy. It was always two different persons. One was running the, the cleaning and the maintenance. And the other one was running the, uh, the, the, the staff and running all the other aspects of the gym. So very close friends, they always give me head, uh, heads up and give me uh, ideas and how to do things. So that helped me a lot. That was like a internship that I did at Marcelo for the two years, 2018 and 19. And the best part, they, Marcelo know that I was always wanted to open my gym. So it was always clear and he always support me and it was perfect. I had a very good uh, training process. Let's put it like that. That's it's like you're talking about these three. You know, Gary and I, we talked about this all the time, all the time. But there's like the three things that you mentioned. One is the jujitsu itself, like the art of jujitsu. Two is being a coach or instructor, right? Teaching jujitsu. And three is running the business. And in my mind, at least, you can't be successful with only two. There's all three of them have to be strong and they have to be continuously learning continuously evolving and all three of them are necessary for one to be really successful as a business owner as a jiu-jitsu instructor as a jiu-jitsu academy owner would, it, would, would you agree with that let's put it like that i think being the running the business it's very important of course being a good teacher instructor is very important to own a jiu-jitsu academy being a World class atlas is good for advertising and bringing people into your door, but it's not necessarily as important as being a good instructor running the business well to have a successful academy. That's my opinion. And I was lucky that I, I had a chance to compete and, and start Jiu Jitsu early. And I fought in very, a lot of tournaments, very different organizations. Is It's great because I started, as I mentioned, I started the academy with something to rely on it. But in the end of the day, people don't really know who is a champion today if you're walking in the, first, in the door. They will know who is the best academy in the area because of the Google reviews, as you guys mentioned, because of the pictures on the internet. Mm -hmm. So being a competitor, it is important. Yes, it, it adds up value to the gym. There's no doubt about it. But it's not the top category as being a good instructor or being a good manager. Of being it, a good, of being good business manager. Is it possible to have a very successful academy without being a competitor? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. You have people who have very good academies that were not a competitor. And you yet, have people who had very good numbers who make a very good living that did not compete. Well, it's not even did not compete. Didn't. It's not a like a uh, world famous athlete and you have a lot of them a lot of places in the country a lot of places in europe that are like that yeah and it, probably the opposite direction too there's a lot of very accomplished athletes who i think you have more you have more of those that option very accomplished athletes that cannot make a successful cat right right Right. And it's kind of sad, don't you think? I mean, it, they've put so much work into being an athlete and being a world champion and, and achieving all these, all, these, all these credentials. And then it's difficult to make a living on it. Um, and often it boils down to the process, understanding how to run business. Um, 
would you agree that being being a world champion is not the same as being a, a, a phenomenal instructor or a phenomenal business owner? Yes, I agree. I'm like, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. The, the, the thing is, what is said is that to be a world champion, you have to get a lot of dedication. And if you're able to channel that dedication into learning how to be a good instructor, you, you're going to be a fantastic instructor. And if you channel that dedication into being a, a, a business owner, business manager, you will be a fantastic business owner, business manager. You just need the right person to guide you through all that direction. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard when you you don't have the direction and you have you don't have anybody to help you with. You you did mention that you were lucky enough to spend a couple of years with Marcelo. You had access to these different individuals. Uh, you almost treated like an internship, where you were learning hands. Was, I, I I was internship, guys. I had a plan, and and my plan was like, I'm Marcelo, I'm going to succeed. Marcelo comes from an alliance with Jitsu. Fabio Gugel is well known. Mm-hmm. for being one of the most successful um, business person side of jiu-jitsu sport. And Marcelo is side hand with Fabio Gugel. Yeah. Like he always got hands from Fabio. Marcelo itself is a very good um, business person with a fantastic team. So I was in the right place at the right time to learn everything I could. Yeah, that's phenomenal. That support network is critical to the success. Oh, what is it like? So my head is exploding. Right <laughs> that time is a, is just wants to keep talking business, business. Um, <laughs> You had this goal of getting your black belt uh, and opening your academy. Did you did you have the goal of who you were going to train under, who you were going to get it with? Was that part of your plan, or was it more happenstance? You know, things just kind of fell into place. So, as I mentioned, like when I lost words, I had just changed from Unity to Marcel Garcia Cat. That was uh, a personal choice, including some career choice that I told to see more in Marcel. But being a Marcelo it was, was already a, the choice that I had to make because think about it. If I have a diploma from uh, the University of X city in Brazil, people say, all right, that's a good diploma. But if you mention you have a diploma at University of Harvard or NIU, people are like, oh, I know Harvard. I know NIU. That's, mm-hmm. that's really cool. You understand? Yeah. So when you mention, I got my black belt from person X. Oh, I don't know that, but that's cool, your black belt. But when you say, oh, I got my black belt from Marcelo Garcia. Mm-hmm. People are going to look, wow. It definitely yeah. Yeah, I know way. Marcelo Garcia, you understand? Yeah. When you say, I got my black belt from Harja Gracie. Like, wow, everybody yeah. your knows friend, Harja uh, Gracie, you understand? Your friend Marcus said something very similar just a couple of weeks ago here with us, where it was like, you know, if I do, I want to go to junior college or do I want to go to Harvard? And if I have the opportunity, I'm going to go to Harvard. And I think that's one hundred percent. That's great. He got that idea from me. I think. <laughs> <laughs> you stole nice. it. Nice. I'll, I'll, ma- I'll send. I'll send him a message later. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen. I mean, all the all the serious stuff aside, what's the most rewarding things thing for you right now? As you have a successful academy, as you are a successful instructor, as things are going well right now, what is the one thing that makes you smile? What's the one thing that really makes it satisfying? Um, after all this hard work that you've been doing and you continue doing? Oh, man, like the people that I met is fantastic. I have so many good friends that I just met here that like I, I love spending time with them. And by the fact that I can spend more time with family as well, it's fantastic too. I can drive my daughter to school every morning. A lot of people are not, um, they don't have this pleasure that I have, you understand? That makes me really happy being in contact with family, having met new people and like such fantastic people in Long Island. I just love them so much. And it's, it really gives me joy. I'm really, I look forward to, to, to see them at the gym and having fun every day. They show up to class. It, it feels great. It's fantastic. Is it, isn't it satisfying when you walk into the class and everybody is there with smiles on their faces, they want to do jujitsu and it's such a great, great environment, great vibe. Man, think about it. those people are happy to see you there. Like, like how great is that? Like these people are grateful for you to be there and you are grateful for them to be there, to be your student is, is, as you say, they are so, it's such a joyful situation that both sides of the, of the coin are happy and everybody's loving it to be together and learn something, get a good, get a good training, like talk, get a good laugh. 
You understand? No, oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Everybody's, 100%. everybody's happy until you start doing neon belly or uh, loop <laughs> jokes. Or... <laughs> yeah, but everything went went away in the in the locker room talk. When the locker room talk, nothing beat the locker room talk. Uh-huh. <laughs> and you it. can always tap, right? You can always tap. So. Oh man, my mind is exploring with all the gold, golden nuggets, all the wisdom that you're sharing with us today. Um, before we wrap this up, before we kind of uh, you know come to the end, at the end of each episode, we do this very unique thing, where the guests who are sitting in your seat um, last time um, asked a question, and they didn't know that you're gonna be you're gonna be talking to us today, so they had no idea who who's gonna be after them. But they did ask a question, and we will will ask you that question, and we'll, let's see what uh, what's on your mind. Uh, from that perspective, Gary's going to take a lead on that. Yeah. So this is from uh, Ricardo Almeida, who was here. And, oh, no. Uh, yes. I know Ricardo <laughs> so well. Listen, before you guys ask the question, uh-huh. this is what the story about me and Ricardo Almeida. Oh, oh do tell, do tell, do tell. I was a blue belt, and I went to this tournament in New Jersey, and and he's like, their man in New Jersey. Uh-huh. And I see this guy, and like he speak Portuguese. I say, hey. Listen, if you know something here, if you know somebody in Jiu Jitsu, I would like to work in the tournament. And he knows the guy who owns the tournament, so he put me to work. And then later on, I thought, oh my God, this is Ricardo Almeida. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it's really <laughs> because you, you have this story of Ricardo Almeida in this great team in New Jersey, of MMA team. And it's like, oh my, I can't believe that is him. And like, and uh, since then, he always treats me so nicely, such a nice person. Oh, that's and great. He, he's amazing. The work that he has done with the MMA team is fantastic. Isn't it? Isn't yeah, it? And awesome. such a great, oh my God. such a brilliant mind too. There is, I, you know, it was so, so phenomenal talking to him. So, um, okay. What was the question? All right. The question no is. No pressure on you. No, no pressure on you. Is, this is a question from the, and the only. Ricardo one and Mena. only. <laughs> one and only. Uh, what is the best advice for someone who is just getting started? So what would you give, what advice would you give to somebody who's just getting started? Someone who's just getting started in jiu-jitsu is, let me think, the best advice to someone who's just getting started, what I would say to my students, they are new. Oh, I, I like to use a metaphor for that. Jiu-jitsu is like a newborn. The first week you know nothing. But in the first month, you already start showing some understanding of life, some understanding what you do. After three months, you're already laughing, you're already talking, like making noises, you're already recognizing people. So jujitsu is just like a newborn. In the beginning, you know nothing. You should just be happy and absorbing as much as you can. And with time, things are going to start getting into places. And little by little, we're going to be start understanding the journey a little more. That's great. I love, I love it. it. That's great advice. I'm, I'm totally stealing that from you. <laughs> I'm, ta- I'm stealing that. I'm totally going to use this yeah. my, with my students. Marcus, I love that. Marcus stole his other analogy. You're going to steal this one? This is what happens. He's going to have none of his own stuff? This is what happens between <laughs> instructors, okay? Uh-huh. We just steal things from each other, okay? Oh, it, it's the best thing to do. It's uh-huh. so much good information yeah. out of there. We should definitely be having more connections and stealing <laughs> things from Absolutely. each other. I got Absolutely. a good story about that. I'll share it with you later, but because it's going to be uncomfortable, but it's a good one. <laughs> Great. Great. But isn't that true? I think in, in general, jujitsu instructors and, and, and academy owners are so willing, at least the ones I've met, you know, through this podcast and just meeting in person and doing seminars and other things, they, they're so willing to share information, but often what really it takes is asking the right questions. And that, I think often what we don't do enough. I agree. Like guys, you have like on my Instagram, I have a hundred instructors that I know them by the tip of my finger. Yeah. I can send them an audio, audio message. Hey, listen, I have this problem that is happening in my academy. How are you dealing with this problem in your place? And you send that message to five people, just like they have five different opinions. That you can, if they really uh, pass through that, you can take, you don't have to follow them, but you just can take that feedback and, and have a, a, like an option to, to use it if you want to, you understand? It's, 
And we should definitely be having a connection, a convention, something like that, that transcends lim- lines of like uh, affiliations. You should definitely be like an, an academy, um, like like instructors or academy owners uh, workshop that people can express their ideas and share what is happening of good and bad in their own academies. Yeah, it's That's almost great. it's almost like jujitsu. When we when we do the same thing over and over and over, we don't see the one little detail that could change everything. And then somebody comes to us and tells us like, "How come you not this right here? Look at this!" And we're like. <laughs> Oh, oh my god! I've never seen this before. Twenty years they've been doing this. Am I am I right? A hundred percent, one thousand percent. I was having a problem with my kids' class that the kids like they are not seeing progress. They sometimes they don't want to come to class, and then they create this little thing that they get a sticker on the on the card every time they come to class. Now they count in the end of the class. They count how many classes they need. Yeah. And and just like that, it changed everything. I got that idea for somebody that I haven't seen like two years, but it had a close contact. And I was like, wow, that's unbelievable. Mind-blowing. Hold on. Mind I'm blowing. R- writing that down. Uh, <laughs> see, Gary's stealing stuff from you. Now. I'm, not, I'm not the only one stealing stuff. I'll give here. you credit, though. I'll give you credit. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I'm going to create a podcast to have you guys at the one. Is it my podcast so I can steal your idea? Uh-huh. That's it. That's, right. Let's do it. Yes, let's do should. it. Invite me. Don't get. Don't invite me. No, I never no, get invited. No, no, no. I don't have my black belt, so <laughs> nobody invites me to anything. <laughs> oh man, what a what a what a what a mind blowing conversation. Um, you know, be, before we finish this up, before before we wrap this up formally, where can listeners find you where can people find you if anybody wants to ask jiu-jitsu questions or owner academy questions or or any type of questions are you accessible on social media so as i mentioned is you can always contact royal jiu-jitsu instagram if i don't answer right away uh, the person responsible for that social media page will always ask me the question and i give the answer back we can always shoot us an um, uh, email that is contact at royal jiu-jitsu academy it's very easy it's like you can find a on the email and on our website. It's very simple and we're very responsive through that. In my personal social media, you can always text message, uh, direct message me. I'm more than happy to help and answer. I don't know much, but what I know, I try to share with everybody that is willing to learn. You are a very humble man, let me tell you. Very humble man. I learned a lot today and I do appreciate, we do appreciate yeah, you being here and sharing everything uh, with us. Yeah, I think it's great. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, we love having you. Hopefully we can have you back again. Uh, and I, th- I think what's really great about this is, you know, and we, we mentioned Marcus Johnson just a few minutes ago too, is that these are a couple of young guys. Uh, Thomas and I, if you can't tell, we're getting a little up here in age. Got some gray in our <laughs> beard. Listen, listen, let's get this straight, okay? <laughs> let's get this straight. Mine is wisdom. Uh huh. Sure. Is, mine is wisdom. Sure. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and mine is because of Thomas. But uh, but it's great to see like you know younger guys really just killing it out there uh, in in so many different ways and being so positive. So so I just want to congratulate you and say thank you for that as well. Thank you guys for having me in the podcast. I appreciate your time, and I'm just happy to to share like one of the points that I like on jujitsu that is moving from athlete perspective into uh, instructor, full-time head coach perspective. And I wish if more of my friends and people who come with my generation would listen and, and trying to, to get themselves better into the second part of it, because in a long-term situation that is more reliable, that is well, it's more unstable. And I think everybody should be transi- making these transitions, and that would definitely make sure she to grow as one. Beautiful. beautiful. I love it. Well, let's wrap this up. Thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing your beautiful, beautiful story. We wish you much success in the future, and we'll be following right from the sidelines. And if you're ever in the Chicago area, make sure you stop by. Sounds good, guys. Let's keep in contact. Everybody who's coming to Long Island, New York, make sure you stop a Royal. going to be my guest. Just mention that you're listening to the podcast. We're going to be taking good care of you. All right? <laughs> I love it. I love Thank it. you so much. Peace. We'll Thank you, guys. Peace. Thank you. Later. Thank you for listening to Raw Radio. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review and help us make the show even more amazing. For future episodes, check out our website and follow us on all major podcast platforms. Take care. Thank you.